Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 1, Text Number 32 Vrito Vrito Vrido Taraushto Dara Eva Lobho Dharma Stano Dharma Hato Sya Krishnam Kas Tasya Medram Vrishanao Cha Mitrao Kukshihi Samhudra Girayo Sti Sangaha Vrido Tarosto Dara Eva Lobo Vrido Tarosto Dara Eva Lobo Dharma stano dharma patosya pristam Dharma stano dharma patosya pristam Kastasya me dram vishanao chamat mitrao Kastasya me dram vishanao chamitrao Kukshi hi samudra girayosti sangaha Kukshi hi samudra girayosti sangaha Vrito tarasto dareva lobo Dharma stano dharma patosya pristam Kastasya medram vishanao cha mitstrao Kukshi hi samudra girayosti sangaha Modesty Uttara Upper Oshta Lip Adaraha Chin Eva Certainly. Certainly, Lobaha, Lobaha. Hankering, Dharmaha, Dharmaha. Religion. Religion, Stanaha, Stanaha. Breast, Breast. Adharma. Adharma, Irreligion, Irreligion. Pataha. Pataha. Pataha, Way, Way. Asya. Asya. Asya, His, His. Pristam, Back, Back. Kaha, Kaha. Brahma. Brahma. Brahma, Tasya, Tasya. His. His. Medram, genitals, Brishanao, testicles, Cha, also, Mitrao, the Mitra Varunas, Kukshihi, waste, Samudraha, the oceans, Girayaha, the hills, Asti, bones, Sangaha, stack. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Modesty is the upper portion of His lips. Hankering is His chin. Religion is the breast of the Lord. And irreligion is His back. Brahmaji, who generates all living beings in the material world, is His genitals. And the Mitra Varunas are his two testicles. The ocean is his waist, and the hills and mountains are the stacks of his bones. Purport. The Supreme Lord is not impersonal, as misconceived by less intelligent thinkers. Rather, he is the Supreme Person, as confirmed in all authentic Vedic literatures. But his personality is different from what we can conceive. It is stated here that Brahmaji 
acts as his genitals and the mitra varunas as are his two testicles. This means that as a person he is complete with all bodily organs, but they are of a different types with different potencies. When the Lord is described as impersonal, therefore, it should be understood that his personality is not exactly the type of personality found within our imperfect speculation. One can, however, worship the Lord even by seeing the hills and mountains or the ocean and the sky as different parts and parcels of the gigantic body of the Lord, the Virat Purusha. The Virat Rupa, as exhibited by Lord Krishna to Arjuna, is a challenge to the unbelievers. So this chapter is called the first step in God-realization. Uh, because uh, persons who are coming out of material consciousness uh, have difficulty in conceiving the uh, holy transcendental nature of God. And therefore, their only hope is to be able to see God reflected uh, within this material creation. And for such persons, this uh, universal form uh, Virat Purusha uh, is um, uh, conceived and we hear some of the descriptions uh, and Prabhupada's purport also uh, tells us how such persons who are materially uh, conditioned will be able to still be, a uh, still be able to uh, see or appreciate God within nature. Uh, this nature uh, as God uh, is something which is common um, in many philosophies. If you may recall, Prabhupada uh, did a book, uh, uh, the, uh, made a plan for presenting Krishna consciousness to the pu public in Japan. Uh, the light of the Bhagavata, he called it. Uh, because the Japanese are very fond of in their Shinto worship of worshiping nature. So Prabhupada selected the uh, rainy season description from the Krishna book, 10th Canto, uh, to preach to them the glories of the Lord, the Bhagavata uh, philosophy, uh, by telling them different things about nature and how nature gives so many lessons uh, about spiritual life. In the same way, here's another example, and, and, and there are so many examples of how people worship nature as God. Uh, this is a little bit uh, more developed idea, to simply see the sun as a great, uh, all right, that's fine. In fact, we see in 10th chapter of the Gita, Krishna does a similar thing with the universal elements. He selects each... Um, uh, magnificent manifestation as an expression of his potency. And so he says, uh, the sun and the moon are my eyes. And so many descriptions are there uh, in the 10th chapter of the Gita. In the same way here, uh, he is selecting various aspects of nature and comparing them to his universal form. So that as he says, everything that is great and wonderful is but a spark of my splendor. We should understand that even though the ocean is vast, even though the mountains are very uh, high, uh, even though the sky and space are unlimited, still they are only but a spark of the splendor of God. As he says, even if Ananta Shesh had you know, unlimited numbers of tongues, unlimited because Ananta Shesh is a snake with so many heads. And Ananta, uh, we say, is the, Ananta is the uh, bed of Vishnu. And one of the things Ananta does is he sings the glories of the Lord. Now, even if Ananta with his unlimited tongues were to go on for unlimited years reciting the glories of the Lord, he could not complete a description of God. Even if it is possible, another statement, even if it is possible to count every grain of sand on all the beaches, you see, of all of the oceans, 
of the universe. Even if it were possible to count all the atoms in existence, still it would be impossible to enumerate fully the glories of the Lord. Which means that the glories of the Lord have no end. Because Krishna's uh, pastimes are in a constant uh, dynamic condition. They, they don't become static. Uh, they're always evolving. And therefore, it is a fact that no one can ever fully comprehend God. Even Krishna himself cannot fully comprehend himself. He becomes amazed to see his devotees' love for him. And that inspires within him a greater love. And that in turn uh, inspires within his devotees still greater feelings of devotion. This is a very modern conception because the uh, very uh, modern theologians, they have this uh, notion that um, God is himself in a constant state of evolution. Well, we, we can accommodate that idea because we say that there's no end to the loving affairs of Krishna and his associates. So they're always evolving. New pastimes, ever new pastimes. And their feelings are ever increasing. There's no limit. And so we can accommodate that theory of the modern uh, theologians that there's no way to, even God is uh, constantly evolving. Uh, this is a very nice idea. We can accommodate this idea uh, within our theology. Uh, so, but there is some uh, fine uh, difference here between the description given here and the description which is generally given for nature's glories. Because all of these glories of nature are placed within the body of God. In other words, the impersonalist or the materialist who is inclined to be an impersonalist when it comes to believing in God or thinking of God is brought around to a personal conception by showing how each and every part of the material creation fits on the body of God. So that when you see the sun and the moon, you don't just say how grand, how glorious, but you say these are the eyes of God. When you plunge within the ocean's depths and you find how deep the ocean is, you know, you know, this is another manifestation of the Lord. Each and everything. And uh, interestingly, Enough, there are negative aspects which are also placed on the body of God. For example, uh, hankering is his chin. Now, we don't normally consider hankering to be a good quality. Right? We say uh, this type of hankering uh, leads to bondage within material existence. And the chin... Uh, uh, is uh, considered to be the Lord's, a manifestation of the Lord's hankering, or uh, irreligion is his back. Again, Krishna says, I descend to defeat irreligion. The last thing in the world we would imagine God should be the source of irreligion. Well, the diff again, different religions have handled this question because we see in the world so much irreligion. Where did it come from? And generally, there's, you know, there's all kinds of polemics which go on. Some blame it on God. Some blame it on human beings. And some blame it on both. And the whole history of Western uh, religion is, you know, it goes through these different types of things. Who to blame for, you know, evil or irreligion? Well, here's our take on it. Uh, irreligion is my back, Krishna says. Irreligion is the back of the Lord. So, uh, that's, that could make someone feel relieved. You see, well, good. I'm glad that it's not my doing. 
In fact, since it's the back of the Lord, you know, I really can't be blamed at all for any irreligious activities. No, that is not the case. Because we know that the living being is responsible. In the Bhagavad Gita, five... It's amazing. Every time our doctor walks in, I come on the same point. I think this must be the fourth time I'm speaking on this point, isn't it? Third time. The same point again about uh, who is to who is responsible for... You must really need this lesson or something. <laughs> who is responsible for... Uh, irreligion, you see. Is it humans or is it God? Uh, this question uh, ha is asked. Now, I think that we can appreciate how subtle are the Vedic sages, you see, and how perfect is our Vedic philosophy. Because please note, everything is seen with, and comprehended within this universal form. However, we are also told that this universal form is not an eternal form of God. It is a conception. You can even say, Prabhupada says, a philosophical conception. So that everything can be placed in existence somehow in connection with God. However, uh, however we don't find that irreligion has any place in the transcendental world or in the transcendental forms of the Lord which are eternal. We don't hear, for example, that Krishna or Narayan or Vishnu accommodates irreligion. Quite the opposite. They descend to destroy irreligion. Yada yada hi dharmasya galarniya bhavati bharata abhyutanam adharmasya tadatmanam sijam yaham Krishna says, I come to dispel your religion. So, this is one of the beauties of our uh, Vedic uh, uh, system, that it presents, as I was explaining, many models of God. It has many aspects uh, in which to explain our overall philosophy. Your religion? All right, we place that on the part of God, the aspect of God, which is called Virat Purush. But when it comes to uh, the aspect of God in his original transcendental forms, as Govinda, as Narayan, as Vishnu, then irreligion is different. For example, now this is very interesting, you will not find um, irreligion, for example, well, there are acts, even in the leelas of God, which appear to be irreligious. Just like when, when Ram slew Vali. You know, the Sugriva and Vali are brothers. Vali was the king. And Ram, uh, and they were fighting. Sugriva and Vali were fighting because Vali had stolen Sugriva's uh, wife. And it was clear that Sugriva was going to lose. But Ram had guaranteed Sugriva protection. So when he saw that his devotee was being defeated, what did Ram do? Hiding behind, hiding, hiding behind the tree, he shot an arrow which pierced the heart of Vali and killed Vali. Now Vali fell to the ground and before he expired, he questioned Ram. Actually, what he saw when he looked in the arrow that was in his heart, pulled out the arrow, very difficult to do such a thing, pulled the arrow out, and he looked, and on the shaft of the arrow, he saw, you know, Rama, the name Rama, and he couldn't believe it, that the great hero, the worshipable deity, Rama, could have shot an arrow. And he challenged Ram. How could you do this? You who are the personification of Dharma. How could you hide and from your hiding place shoot an arrow? You should have at least come out and challenged me to a fight. 
This is a highly irreligious act. Of course, I, I have explained this before, that Lakshman, Ram's brother, then came out. Of course, Ram said, you deserve to die because you stole someone's wife, which is an irreligious act and you should be killed for that. But Vali wasn't satisfied until Lakshman explained in a, in a more subtle understanding. He said, look, if Ram had come out to fight, you being a worshiper of Ram wouldn't have fought him anyway. And he, yet he had to kill you. But you wouldn't have fought him. So besides that, he said, so this was one example he gave, one reasoning he gave, which was a good argument. He said, you deserve to die for what you did. Ram had to kill you. But if, you had, if he had come out and challenged you a fight, because you are his submissive devotee, you wouldn't have fought him. And therefore, he couldn't have killed you. You would have sought shelter, in fact. And because he is all merciful, he would have been forced to give you shelter. But he already promised shelter to your brother Sugriva. And if both of you had sought shelter, it would have put him in difficulty. Lakshman gave many arguments to, and gradually Vali became satisfied. Now, my point is, Apparently, Ram did something irreligious. But by the explanation of Lakshmana, it was resolved. Krishna similarly does apparently something irreligious. What does he do? He apparently dances with others' wives, you know, which is, of course, enough for Ram to have killed Vali. So how can Krishna do this? Of course, again, we see that the Acharyas have explained that this was not an irreligious act. First of all, many of these ladies descended from the kingdom of God with Krishna. Uh, others were uh, um, duplicates, or the, you can say the originals, but duplicates of them were manifested for their husbands, but the original forms were uh, enjoyed by Krishna alone. In other words, it is explained by the Acharyas that Krishna never touched the wives of anyone. But the original forms of these wives were enjoyed by Krishna and only duplicate forms were touched by their husbands. And those women who were not qualified, uh, uh, Vishwana Chakravati Thakur explains, they were uh, not able to join Krishna. If they still had any attachment to material life, to family, friendship, and love, they could not join Krishna. And they were forced to remain at home. And it was these women who lay with their husbands and became pregnant, etc., etc., and had children. Because if you remember, Krishna tells the gopis, go home to your children. Well, the children are the children of gopis who were not yet ready to be with Krishna alone. Then how is it that they finally came to be with Krishna? Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says that they heard from those gopis who had joined Krishna, who were in their original qualified forms. They heard from these gopis and they developed such a traction, such an attraction for Krishna that they became mad in love of separation and they gave up all attachment and died mentally. Mentally, not physically. That means their entire existence became transformed. And in such a transformed state, then they were able to join with Krishna. The point I'm making is that an irreligious act of being with others' wives is, is actually explained by the Acharyas in a way to show that it was not irreligious whatsoever. There was no irreligion in it. Uh, the point that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur makes about this is that those acts which appear to be most irreligious in this world become glorified in spiritual life. That means paramour love, or the love of another who is not one's wedded wife, is disgraceful and despicable in this world. But in the spiritual world, it is elevated to the highest position. Because estheticians say that the love between lovers is more intense than the love between husband and wife because the love between husband and wife is guaranteed and it has no obstruction. Whereas the love that one feels for a lover has to overcome so many obstacles. So because it has forced to overcome so many obstacles, it increases its intensity. Now, I'm not telling you all of this so that each 
of you goes out and finds some lover. Because I have said very clearly that in this world it is despicable. We are not Krishna. We do not have transcendental bodies. And any kind of, you know, loving of, of, with these bodies, you know, is mundane. And it becomes not only mundane, but irreligiously mundane when it is not with one's wife. So, that's not our intention. But our intention is to show how irreligion is dealt with, you see, in our Vaishnava Siddhanta, how we deal with irreligion. Uh, but generally, we see that God upholds religion in very traditional ways, giving shelter always. Krishna does wonderful things when he comes, comes into the he kills that Bomasura demon. I think Bomasura. He, 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 who had 16,000 wives in prison. And then they all say, what will happen to us? Krishna says, now you can go free. I've liberated you. They said, who will deal with us now? We have been touched by another man. You please accept us as your wives. And so Krishna married 16,000 wives. Of course, Prabhupada points out that if you think by this example of Krishna that you can take more than one wife, then you should also be prepared and qualified as Krishna was. Because Krishna didn't tell all of his wives, okay, here's the house, you can all live together. Anybody knows that that would not be possible. Even two women living in the same house, you know, aren't such an easy thing to deal with. Well, Krishna had 16,000 wives. What did he do? He created a separate palace for each and every wife. And if that, as if this was not enough, because still there would have been problems. Because can you imagine how long it would have taken for him to get, you know, to be with each of his wives? Well, 16,000 days, 16,000 days in a year is the 365 days. So what does that mean, make? Hey, you're a big mathematician. Huh? 48 years. And Krishna had stayed on this planet only 125 years. If he was in Vrindavan, say, for 12 years, so, you know, subtract that, he had 112 years. He only had 110 years or so. Right? And, and he didn't immediately get married with all of them anyway, so maybe 100 years. 110 years. Well, he would have only been able to see each one of his wives twice. So that would not have satisfied them. What did he do? He expanded himself to be with each and every wife simultaneously. This is God. So but next, you know, before anybody, not next time, but before time, before any of you contemplate, you know, trying to satisfy a husband, a wife, and a lover, a husband or a wife, and a lover at the same time, first of all, be able to expand yourself. And then you can, can take it up. You can consider taking up the idea. Until you can take up that idea, you can't do it. This is how we handle the idea of irreligion. Of course, in our own practical lives, now another point to understand is, if a man or woman is made in God's image, if we are made in God's image, if we are by nature of the same quality as God, then we have to understand that all of these qualities which are described in God are also within us. So when it says, modesty is the upper portion of his lips, hankering is the chin, hankering, modesty, irreligion, religion is, his, is the breast of the Lord, the front of the Lord is religion. So each and every one of these qualities is within us. Uh, and anyone who reads 16th chapter of the Gita should, if they're honest, it, acknowledge this fact. That we have divine and we have demoniac qualities. Uh, we are very much like God, but in a very minute degree. Quantitatively, uh, we are insignificant. God is most significant. But qualitatively, we are one with God. Now... This uh, explanation, as Prabhupada points out, is meant to assure everyone, God is personal. If Krishna is personal, we can see that clearly. But even the 
universe is personal. In other words, for those who are able, not able, to go beyond the material aspect, still they can be fixed in a personal conception, a personal meditation on God. That's the purpose of this chapter. This chapter is meant as a first step in God realization. All of the different statements of the Bhagavatam are meant to bring home the point, God is a person. Why? Because unless God is a person, we cannot experience satisfaction in our heart. Everyone is searching for love. Everyone is searching to offer and to, to receive love. If God is impersonal, if we are ultimately also not persons, then it makes all of our emotions uh, mundane. There's no hope of uh, purifying these emotions. When we say purification of emotions, purification of desire, we don't mean elimination of desire. Sometimes people say, I have to get free of desires. But that's not our philosophy. We don't say, I have to get free of desire. What do we say? I have to, get, I have to purify my desire. Purify my death. That's why Krishna says, Kamo Sri Bharata Sabha, Dhamma Varuda Bhute Shu. Kamo Sri Bharata Sabha. What is the most difficult desire to get free from? Sex desire, attraction for the opposite sex. But Krishna says, Kamo Sri Bharata Sabha. I am Kamo Sri. I am sex. I am pure. If Dhamma, Dhamma Varuda Bhute, if sex life which is not opposed to religious principles, I am that. Come. I am that desire. The whole idea here is we are not denying desires. We are not uh, denying people that you cannot have a uh, sexual attraction. You cannot have an appetite for eating nice foodstuffs. You cannot, uh, you know, uh, dress yourself properly, whatever it may be. Uh, no, we don't say that. You can't work or you might, cannot have a family. Uh, we don't deny any of these things, but they have to be done in a religious way. That is human civilization. Animal civilization is animal society is different. And even that is not irreligious. You remember Vali was very clever. What did he give as an argument why it was all right to steal Sugriva's wife? What did he say? Yeah, he said, I can do that because I'm only a monkey. So I'm not a human. These rules don't apply to me. And of course, you know, Ram and Lakshman said, you're not a monkey. You're too intelligent. Anyway, you're a king to begin with and you're, no monkeys are as intelligent as you are. But he said, I'm, I'm, I'm an animal. Animals are not subject to the laws of Dharma. If a tiger devours a human being, is a tiger guilty of, man's, uh, of murder? No. Tiger doesn't get a bad karma for killing, for eating a uh, human being. But if you eat a human being, you know, what do you get from that? Probably they'll make you, you know, your own television show. <laughs> These days, the way things are, you'll immediately, you know, come, you'll be put in, featured in all the front, you know, covers of ma most magazines and you'll get your own television series. Man eaters. You know, but, Normally, you know, you would, you know, you should be chopped up and fed to, you know, fed to the vultures. If that's the way you are, you should become vulture food. But now we don't have such justice. Now justice has become, you know, very strange. Justice used to be based on, you know, the laws of God. That was the principles of justice were religiously or spiritually based. But now, People are becoming more and more clever. But still there is a sense of justice. It's very interesting to know that all over the world, pretty much there are, in, among civilized people, they come to the same conclusions about justice. They, they all come with, with the same basic for, uh, forms of justice. You know, like, for example, that murder is bad. Uh, you can't have a society if you have a, the principle that people are allowed to kill each other. As soon as you say people are allowed to kill each other, this, it's impossible to have a, an organized society. 
So practically all over the world, through all different civilizations, they have agreed it's not good to kill others. So there, that seems to imply that there are some basic values which are intrinsic to human life. In other words, that the ideas of justice are not whimsical. They're not, you know, just to be made up at any time in any way. But they're based on some true values because we find them repeated in all different societies and civilizations. Of course, we can go one step further back and say yes, because they're originally coming from God. We can, but they stop short of that, materialistic philosophers, and they say humans have evolved these. In any case, in any case, uh, we have to follow Dharma. We cannot be irreligious and at the same time say we are trying to practice Krishna consciousness. And sometimes devotees think that they can play around, you see, with religious principles. Oh, well, you know, the end justifies the means. That can be very, very abused. The end just, but since I'm giving everything to Krishna, I can steal. I can steal, I can lie, I can cheat. Because after all, I'm doing it for Krishna. Well, Prabhupada was very clear about this. He said, you have to follow the laws. You cannot do these things and justify it saying, you know, the end justifies the means. The end and the means are one in Krishna consciousness. In fact, people will not understand primary religious principles. Like if we start to simply talk about bhakti, to most people, they won't understand. Who is one of the best preachers we had in the early days? You see, Jayananda. And I always remember Jayananda would preach to these, you know, to the garbage collectors. The garbage men would come around and Jayananda would preach. And how would he preach? He would help them by picking up the trash cans from our front, you know, the storefront and, and help them to dump the garbage into the truck. Nobody else did that. So everybody else would just stand there and watch them do it. But he, no, no, he wouldn't. He would think, I'll help. And just by that type of, that's not primary religion. He was doing it as a service to Krishna. But from their point of view, they judged it as a secondary religious principle. This man is very humble. He's very helpful. They saw so many secondary principles. And they judged, I can appreciate your religion. So most people will appreciate. That's why, for example, uh, people appreciate charity or welfare work. Now, those things are not directly, they're not Sanatan Dharma in and of themselves. Like Mother Teresa is very famous, right? What does she do? She's not famous uh, apparently for her uh, uh, direct bhakti activity. She's apparently, you know, she's famous for her relief work, for the poor, for the sick. That's how people judge religion these days. Now, uh, we may not have the, the energy at this point to open hypospels, and neither have we been particularly instructed to do so. Uh, our Prabhupada told us that we have very limited energy or, or, uh, at our disposal. We should use it for preaching directly, especially book distribution. This is our welfare work. It is very direct. But how we behave as book distributors, Sankirtan devotees, uh, temple pujar, just like I always appreciate, you know, if any guest comes, Nila Madhava will always stop and take care of them. In the morning, if you must have seen her do that. If any guests come in, she looks after them. She'll get them prasadam or do something for them. People like, this is very much appreciated. People judge our movement, you see, by simple acts. Not simply by, you know, you can't tell people our movement's the best because look how many books we distributed last week. Do you realize that we defeated Los Angeles? They think, you know, that, in fact, they might even misunderstand that competition. I thought this was a spiritual movement. They wouldn't understand transcendental competition. But they might understand a very simple act of humility, of kindness, or even let's get to a more base. They might appreciate the fact that you're dressed properly. Why is it that Prabhupada shaved his face nearly every day? I mean, 
sannyasis definitely don't have to do this. And Prabhupada's Guru Maharaj did not do it. Why did Prabhupada do that? Well, for two reasons. One was for our own example. And another was to make a statement to the world that we are, you know, we are not indifferent to the world. We are here. We are living here. We accept your customs, but we do everything for Krishna. Sometimes devotees had a reputation, you know, for wearing two differently colored socks. Have you ever seen devotees wearing two differently colored socks? Well, I'm glad that you haven't, Rasika. That means that the devotees here are well trained. But that was a stereotype, wasn't it, Prajapati? Yeah, communal socks. A bin of socks. A bin of socks. So you were lucky if you ever could find two that matched. And Prajapati Prabhu was giving us the background of why it was that the socks were different color. Because the socks were communally owned. Everything was communally owned. Not in the temples I was in charge of, but I never instituted communal. Yeah. That was the East Coast. We were on the West Coast. We were more polished <laughs> or attached. I guess the East Coast would say you were just more attached to your socks. So uh, we, we should understand then that um, there are many lessons to be gained from these uh, purports and examples. But the, I guess the point I'm making towards the end now is uh, example. Example. The Lord is an example here of all qualities. The Guru teaches by his example. And we as devotees of Krishna must uh, teach by our example. But everything must have a transcendental connection. No use in teaching simply mundane things. Uh, Jayananda or Prabhupada or Krishna, every one of them uh, is trying to relate what they do to to spiritual activities, so that the message comes through clearly. Uh, this is not simply mundane piety. This is transcendental life. So we'll stop here and ask if anybody has any questions. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Because if God is not evolving, how could he be complete? In other words, one of the things of completion or fullness is that there's no limit. So if you say that there's a limit, then it means he's, then, then there's something missing. You're limiting God by saying he's everything and he cannot become more. That's putting a limitation on God. So complete means that... Uh, now they may say, all right, but then since there's more to... Because, since he's in a state of becoming and not being, that's the popular terminology. Since he's in a state of becoming and he's not in a state of being, then at the moment that he's in being, he hasn't yet become what he will become. Therefore, there's something missing in him. Now, what's the answer? There is a good answer for this. I mean, at least I have. I got the answer that I, I have thought of. I'll just say what I've got in my mind. That, it, that becoming doesn't exist until he becomes that. It does not exist. It only exists in, in terms of theory. But in reality, the becoming has not existed until he has become that. So he's never incomplete. There's not something that already exists that he is not, and now he's going towards it. It doesn't exist until he becomes that thing. So they can't accuse Krishna that you are not yet achieved your full status. Because that full status is constantly evolving and he creates that status itself. I like that we can juggle the words. But actually, the philosophers are interested in things like this. These are the kind of puzzles they like to play with so that they don't have to surrender. <laughs> you know, they just like to play around with mental puzzles all day and they say, you know, once I've got all the puzzles worked out, I'm going to decide whether or not I want to worship God. After many births and death. But the one puzzle that they can't figure out is death. They can't figure out how to survive death, at least not within this body. Another question or comment? Yes. 
what is it that tra trans yeah transcendental means beyond the modes of the material nature beyond the material existence or uh, transcendental it means beyond birth and death beyond uh, the material energy which is in three modes goodness passion and ignorance to be unaffected by hankering and lamenting all of these are different ways of explaining transcendental to transcend the bodily conception but do you know how to transcend the bodily conception the first thing you have to do is know that you are your body before you can know that you're not your body you should know you are your body now what does that mean that means first of all the Bhagavad Gita gives a lot of instruction about how to take care of this body if our, our philosophy is simply you're not your body then why does the Bhagavad Gita say Krishna says in the Gita that one who eats too much or too little can't be a yogi one who sleeps too much or too sleep if you're not your body what difference does it make Krishna says it does make a difference it makes a big difference how much you eat and sleep how much you you know enjoy recreation you know that they that they neglect caring for their body first of all be in your body you know then transcend your body Another question or comment? Good. An early ending. Jai. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki. Jai. Today is very good weather, so we hope that there will be a good Sankirtan today. Book distribution today, and what's tonight? Harinama. Jai. So everybody gather for Sankirtan and Harinama.